virtually can hear you. For those, partic for those participating via Zoom, please remember to unmute your device before speaking and mute when you are not speaking to create a positive experience for all attendees. When speaking, please state your name when making a comment or asking a question. Phone participants should use star six to mute and unmute and star nine to raise their hand. The MAG public comment process provides opportunities for members of the public to comment uh, on items scheduled on today's agenda or on items that fall under MAG's jurisdiction. Uh, so do we have any uh, members of the community that want to speak today? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. We have received no public comments for this meeting. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, before we begin uh, with the roll call of the members, I would like to emphasize that this special meeting was called to address the impact of the veto of the enabling legislation for extension of Proposition 400, HB 2685, on infrastructure projects in Maricopa County. And I would like to uh, uh, recognize and welcome Scarlett Spring, uh, who will be the new Greater Phoenix Leadership Representative on the EDC. Uh, her appointment is expected to be approved by the council later this month. We will look forward to you participating with our group. Also, I'd like to congratulate uh, Nancy Smith uh, on becoming mayor uh, of uh, Maricopa. Thank you very much. I uh, will now begin uh, meeting with a roll call. Thank you, Vice Chair Melnar. I will go through the list of members. Please make sure you are unmuted and indicate if you are present when I call your name. Ruben Alonzo. Present. Thank you. Steve Betts. Tony Bradley, Vice Mayor Durham. Here. Thank you. Paul Carden. Vice Mayor Crane. Present. Thank you. Council Member Edwards. Present. Thank you. Supervisor Thomas Galvin. Present. Thank you. James Griffiths. Vice Mayor Hampton. Present. Thank you. Mayor Hermosillo. Sintra Hoffman. Council Member Judd. Present. Thank you. Council Member Keating. Here. Thank you. Jim Kenny. Present. Thank you. Mayor Lavalt. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Council Member Luna. Present. Thank you. Mike Markham. Present. Thank you. Council Member McMahon. Present. Thank you. Council Member O'Brien. Council Member Oliphant. I'm present. Thank you. Council Member Janine Guy. Council Member Pineda. Present. Thank you. Darcy Renfro. Vice Mayor Rowe. Present. Thank you. Mark Sanders. Present. Thank you. Todd Sanders. Present. Thank you. Council Member September. Mayor Smith. Here. Thank you. Marisa Walker. Present. Thank you. Bob Worsley. Present. Thank you. Chair Lewis is not present. And Council Member Malnar, Vice present. Chair. Thank you. Is there anyone who I did not call who is present? Mr. Vice Chair, we have quorum. Thank you. Uh, please stand with me as we uh, enjoy me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And I jumped the gun a little bit on our call to audience. We've already answered that question, correct? Mr. Vice Chair, yes, we have no comments from the audience. All right, thank you very much. 
Um, yeah, are there any other members here who would like to speak? Seeing none, uh, we'll go ahead on to item number four. Uh, next on the agenda, Nathan Pryor, uh, MAG Policy and Government Relations Director, will provide content for the agenda item. After that, I'd like to invite the Mayor of the City of Avondale, Kenneth Weiss, uh, and Chair of the MAG uh, Regional Council and Maricopa County Supervisor Jack Sellers, Chair of the MAG Transportation Policy Committee to say Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the Economic Development Committee. Uh, so obviously we're here today to talk about uh, Proposition 400, the extension, the enabling legislation uh, that was went through our legislature this session. Um, talk a little bit about the veto. Uh, as uh, Chairman stated, we'll hear from Supervisor Sellers and Mayor Weiss, and then we'll turn it over to MAG staff, John Bolin, to provide a more complete uh, presentation about the the plan, the development of the plan, the elements of the plan, and then uh, potential impacts of the veto. Uh, so just starting from the beginning regarding legislative session, during the legislative session, we were focused on Senate Bill 1356. We provided updates uh, to this body during the legislative session. Uh, 1356 to, to call for a ballot to the voters of Maricopa County to consider extending the absent sales tax for transportation investment. Uh, of note, 1356 contained an emergency clause to get us to a November 2022 ballot. Uh, in late June, a due date was approaching uh, regarding the county's ability to include the proposition on the November 2022 ballot. Uh, it became necessary to move quickly to another legislative vehicle. Uh, we moved to a strike everything bill, House Bill 2685. Uh, that vehicle uh, did drop the emergency clause and redirected us to a March 2023 ballot. In the closing hours of the legislative session, House Bill 2685 did pass in the Senate on a vote of 19 to 9 and subsequently passed in the House 37 to 21. Uh, please be mindful that this was a tremendous success in getting through the legislature. House Bill 2685 was then transmitted to the governor's office on June 24th, 2022. At that time, the outreach to the governor's office continued both by MAG member agencies and by the business community. On Wednesday, July 6, uh, at 3.08 p.m., MAG staff received the governor's veto letter. Uh, please note that without a signature from the governor under interpretation of, of Arizona revised statute, House Bill 2685 would have become law the next day at 12 a.m. Thursday, July 7. We'd like to thank the, our bill sponsors, uh, Senator Pace and Representative Carroll, both legislators were strong bill champions uh, who worked tirelessly with their colleagues to advance the native legislation. We'd also like to extend our thanks to our member agencies, the MAG member agencies, the 27 cities and towns, three native nations, and two counties for their involvement and activity in this effort. And thank you to members of this committee for your continued support of this important endeavor. Uh, the agenda item today being presented will be a review of the, of the approved regional transportation plan with a focus on potential impacts to the transportation program due to the veto. Uh, please note, however, we are working diligently to get this issue to the voters. Much of the recent conversations regarding next steps have taken place with the MAG Executive Committee an executive session with legal counsel. We'll do our best to answer questions, but hope you understand some of the legal considerations that we are navigating. Mr. Chair, today we are joined by Mayor Ken Weiss, Mayor of Avondale, who is the current chair of the MAG Regional Council. He is joined by Supervisor Jack Sellers of Maricopa County, who is the current chair of the Transportation Policy Committee. Uh, Mr. Chair, with your approval, uh, turn it over to Chairman Weiss and Chairman Sellers uh, to make opening remarks to the EDC uh, before MAG staff offers a presentation. Mr. Co-Chair, thank you for, uh, for inviting me and uh, Chairman Sellers today. Um, I think what Nathan has put forth is, is a pretty, uh, pretty succinct wrap up of what the Regional Council Transportation uh, TPC has been through over the last few years and then culminated in the governor's veto. Uh, I will tell you that I took the organization and the regional council uh, by surprise. We really didn't have any indication that the governor was leaning in that way. Uh, we 
reacted pretty quickly. And I think the first thing we did was have a meeting of the executive committee and of the regional council to kind of to get a lay of the land and where we wanted to go from there. Uh, we then sent out uh, thank you letters to every member of the legislature who voted and supported for uh, HB 2685 to let them know that we stand behind them. And then we started the hard work of planning for what's next. And uh, while we can't go into a lot of details, we have not been sitting on our backsides. We have been looking at every possibility and uh, building on relationships that we have that we built during Prop 400 and then um, reaching out for new relationships as we move forward over the next few months and year to get uh, Prop 400E back in the hands of the legislature and signed by uh, whoever the new governor may be. So uh, we've also sat back, or not sat back, we've also looked at uh, what successes we had in 2685, um, where we did really good work, where we needed to step up our game a little bit and uh, are working through those issues. And I feel very confident that we will have um, a successful Prop 400E for the voters of Maricopa County to vote on in the not too distant future. So um, didn't know if there was any questions from the committee or any concerns. I'd be happy to answer before I turn it over to Chairman Sellers. Are there any questions from the member of the committee? Looks like not. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair. Thank you. Pass out. Pass out. Pass out. Okay, thank you so much. Why am I getting an echo? Anyway, thank you. <laughs> just, just a reminder. Okay, now how are we doing? Better, all right. Uh, well, I have to tell you, to start off that, you know, there's nothing I'm, I'm more passionate about right now than ensuring that we have an infrastructure plan in place to address the growth that we're experiencing and that we've already announced. Um, within an hour of the veto, I had at least a dozen phone calls from legislators saying, Jack, what the hell happened? And I said, I don't know, I'm, I'm a stunned as you are. And they, you know, people from both parties calling me and saying, we had a bipartisan agreement. What happened? So anyway, the Prop 400 extension bill was vetoed. So now what do we do? Everywhere I go, companies and people keep telling me they expect us to handle this. And many of them are telling me that we absolutely need a better transit system to deal with increasing densities as we grow. I recognize some communities don't want light rail as part of their plan, and we should be sensitive to that. But we have to make, retain flexibility for those who do want it. One of the questions I'm frequently asked is, why won't our government allow the voters in Maricopa County to tell us what they want? I'm not sure I know the answer to that. We have over 60% of the population and 70% of the state's economic activity right here in Maricopa County and we are the only county in the state that, has, that needs state approval to refer an issue to our voters. We're currently in the process of bringing together our key business leaders to help determine what the best approach is to achieve a positive result as quickly as possible on these issues. As a reminder, we don't have an infrastructure plan in place today to support current business expansion. I recently talked to the local vice president of Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing, and I'm told that within five years, the current I-17 Loop 303 interchange will be inadequate to handle their growth. And that's just one of many known projects we already have going on today that we don't have a plan in place without Prop 400E to address. Okay, so we can't forget that timing's critical. Unfortunately, there are a lot of leaders who don't understand how infrastructure planning works. To put a plan together, you have to have a known dedicated revenue source. State law does not allow us to have something on our plan without known funding. Since plans and construction are a long-term prospect, 
we need to have project revenue for many years into the future. That means that if this region wants its fair share of the five-year bipartisan infrastructure act, we need funding in place now, not two or three years from now. The choice is very clear. If we're going to sustain the out outstanding economic growth we currently are experiencing, we need a Prop 400 extension passed as soon as possible. We all know there are major challenges in getting a viable and marketable plan in place quickly. So we all have to work together and get this done. Our future depends on it. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Vice Chair, if I could, if I could add on that, I think Chairman Sellers put it perfectly. And when we talk about transportation planning, just as economic development planning, it doesn't happen overnight. And I think what John Boland's going to present here after um, we get done is a pretty dire view of what transportation looks like in the foreseeable future without Prop 400E. Um, the business community uh, relies on the, the transportation in Maricopa County to bring their projects forth. Chairman Sellers touched on TSMC, but there's projects throughout the entire valley. We can look at LG building an incredible facility out in Queen Creek. We can look at Core Power building out in Buckeye, not to mention what's happening in Surprise and Glendale and Goodyear along the 303, what's happening in other parts of the region. So I think when John gets done with his presentation, I think you're going to be stunned at how much this veto impacts the region as a whole. And I think Chairman Sellers and I are on the exact same page. The need for enabling legislation has to happen. And it's gonna take the voices of everyone in this committee, on every MAG committee, on every city council, on every tribal community, on any and every economic development forum uh, to work us through that. So I look forward to the partnership. And um, John, I didn't, want, I didn't mean to, to ruin the end of your presentation, but uh, it is a horror movie in a lot of ways. Okay, thank well, you, and, uh, Mayor Weiss, for your comments. And if I might just add one thing, that I've seen these presentations and they're outstanding. If you have business groups that you can think of that could benefit by seeing this after you see what they present here today, please do that because we need everybody on the same page. Thank you. Are there any questions uh, from any members of the committee at this point? If not, I'd like to introduce uh, John Bullen, uh, MAG Transportation Funding Policy Program Manager, to share the preliminary overview of the potential impacts of HB 28, or 2685 veto. This is an important and, and is discussion only item. Welcome, John. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the EDC. Uh, very pleased to join here, uh, you here today. Uh, thank you, Chair Weiss uh, and Chair Sellers for the comments. I think they were spot on. Uh, and unfortunately, this is not a presentation that we anticipated giving, uh, quite honestly, as Chair had mentioned, the veto very much caught us by surprise. Um, since that point, um, we have scrambled to identify what the exact impacts are. Uh, those are ongoing efforts. Uh, as uh, both chairs had mentioned, transportation planning uh, takes a long time. Uh, these projects are queued up for a long time. Uh, and, and impacts are felt long and wide. So this is very much a continuing effort. Uh, and today I just wanted to provide you with a preliminary overview uh, of what to expect. Next slide, please. So I'll start off uh, by giving a little bit of background. Um, many of you have been around the region uh, a while, but I think it's all important to understand how much of a role the sales tax has played uh, in our region, what we see today and our prosperity. I'll then touch briefly on the investment plan that was unanimously uh, approved by both the MAG Transportation Policy Committee, as well as the MAG Regional Council. Uh, and then I'll talk about potential impacts if we fail to extend the dedicated half cent sales tax and finally conclude uh, with what to expect moving forward. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So as I had mentioned, uh, the sales tax has been an integral part of our region. We were all shocked by the veto, given how much of a role this plays. Just to go back, uh, the sales tax has been in place since 1985. At that time, leaders from around the region, much like yourselves, got together and looked at what transportation investments were needed to support their future quality of life and the economic development that was needed in the region. What they found is that absent a new revenue stream, it would take 60 years to build the Loop 101. Those the leaders at that time determined that is not sufficient, that does not meet the vision that they have for this region, 
and collectively they worked together to pass Proposition 300, which was soundly approved by Maricopa County voters back in 2000 or 1985. Fast forward, that was a 20 year sales tax. In 2004, Maricopa County voters reaffirmed their commitment to the dedicated sales tax and approved Proposition 400. Next slide, please. I cannot overstate the importance that these investments have had on our region. I'd like to illustrate that briefly. The map on the screen shows what the high capacity transportation investments were in the region before Proposition 300. We had I-17, we had parts of I-10, and we had parts of US-60. That's it. Next slide. With Proposition 300, it gave us the initial footprint that you see today. Constructed the Loop 101, the Loop 202 in the Southeast Valley, State Route 51, and State Route 143. Next slide, please. As I had mentioned, voters reaffirmed their commitment to the dedicated half cent sales tax in 2004. As the region matured, so did our investments. That is reflected in the Proposition 400 plan. With Proposition 400, we will have either built or are currently building the Loop 303, Loop 202 South Mountain, the region's high capacity transit network, the interim State Route 24 facility in the Southeast Valley, and in addition, Proposition 400 has also funded more than 250 miles of arterial improvements needed to support economic development activities around the region, funds more than seven and a half million revenue miles of bus service throughout the entirety of the region, funds nearly all of the ADA paratransit service across the region, has provided essential funding to widen and improve freeways, and also supports those quality of life investments that we see through air quality mitigation, active transportation, and safety improvements. Next slide, please. The link between transportation and economic development is well known. Proposition 300 and Proposition 400 have saved businesses and people time. They have saved money. They have created jobs and they increase property values. Next slide. When our economic development corporations go out and recruit new business to Arizona, it is the regional freeway system and the regional transportation system that they put front and center. It's no accident that most of these locates do so in close proximity to a high capacity transportation infrastructure line. Next slide, please. In addition, the public gets it. This is a plan that is built on public engagement for the public, supported by the public. Uh, public has routinely commented how much they like the transportation system. They know what benefit it provides. They have no idea who plans it, but they support it and they support continued investment. Earlier polling this year showed more than 70% favorable opinion for continuation of the dedicated half cent sales tax. That is remarkable. And some of our early public engagement consultants were blown away by the level of support that they saw in this region for transportation investments. The public gets it. Next slide, please. So what does the investment plan look like? Next slide. We spent the last three years putting together a very complex transportation plan. That plan is built on technical analysis. That plan is built on public engagement. It's built on trade-offs and it's built on compromise. The legislature on the front end told us, do not go over half a cent. We listened despite the fact that we demonstrated tremendous need. We identified more than $90 billion of needed transportation infrastructure, but we also knew the political realities and our policymakers responded and reacted accordingly. Because we couldn't get that additional revenue, we took other methods to try and make our plan more efficient. We stretched our dollars further and we made judicious decisions about where to place our investments. In total, uh, the MAG Regional Council approved an investment plan of about $36.8 billion over a 25 year period. Next slide, please. That investment plan supports a number of large capital projects. Those capital projects range from the construction of State Route 30 the I-10 reliever in the Southwest Valley between State Route 85 and I-17. Completion of State Route 24 in the Southeast Valley, that's just an interim facility today. 
reconstruction of the I-17, bottleneck improvements along Loop 101 and Loop 202 in the East Valley, completion of the 303 I-17 system interchange that's needed to support the tremendous growth that we're seeing in the North Valley, as well as a number of arterial investments and high capacity transit investments. Next slide, please. The investment plan also supports a number of programs. These programs are our effective way at dealing with an uncertain future. Funding is committed to programmatic areas and projects can be selected on a periodic basis based on the needs at the time. Significant increases in active transportation to reflect needs of the public. Allocations to arterial widening and improvements throughout the system. Significant increases in safety funding as that becomes a higher and higher priority for the region. Allocations for emerging technologies, signal infrastructure. This is a plan with a gear towards the future. In addition, the plan also features a significant increase in bus transit funding. That was the number one category of need that we heard from our public engagement activities as we put the plan together. Despite where people were, they wanted more transit, they wanted better transit, and the plan reflects that need. Next slide, please. However, uh, we are now facing a situation where we have an uncertain future. Next slide, please. If you take away the dedicated half cent sales tax, it will completely decimate our transportation system. We will lose more than half the available revenues needed to support regional transportation infrastructure. The revenues that are left are restricted and, can't, and we lose our ability to uh, effectively respond to needs. It will be a huge challenge for this region. Next slide, please. So what are those potential impacts? So I'll first start on the arterial program. One of the biggest misconceptions about our investment plan was where the shift of funding is going between Proposition 400 and the extension. When you consider all revenue sources, the biggest shift was not into transit, but rather into the arterial and regional program category. There's two reasons for this. Number one, it reflects the change in priorities across the region. Those quality of life measures that I had mentioned earlier are increasingly important to the public. Investments in active transportation, signal technology, being able to get from your home to work faster is increasingly important to the public. In addition, it reflects a funding reality that the entire state faces. Next slide, please. The chart on the screen shows statewide highway user revenue fund or HERF collections between the year 2000 and 2021. HERF was designed to be the primary funding source for transportation investments in the state of Arizona. This is what most of the state relies on for transportation investments. The bars show total statewide HERF collections controlled for inflation and the, black, the block behind it, excuse me, shows total statewide population. Next slide. So what does it mean? It means that when you control for inflation, we actually collected less in HERF revenues in 2021 than we did in the year 2000. Over the same time, the state's population has grown by more than 40%. That puts a huge strain on HERF recipients, which include ADOT, as well as all the local cities, counties, and towns. Next slide, please. So what does it look like if we don't extend Proposition 400? There's a reason why we saw a significant increase in the arterial and regional programs, and that's because of the demands. This region will be less able to build those new roadways to respond to economic development opportunities. Local agencies will have less resources than they had originally anticipated. They will have to stretch their dollars further. This will result in decaying road conditions. You will see more potholes, you will see more cracks. This will have a devastating impact on the region's arterial network. Next slide, please. Unfortunately, the picture doesn't get any better on the transit side. Next slide. Arizona is unique in that it is one of the only states that does not have a statewide funding source for transit. As a result, here in this region, we are reliant on three sources. Local sources, regional sources, the dedicated half cent sales tax, and federal sources. 
as I had mentioned, the number one category that we heard from the public in terms of a need to expand was transit. As a result, the plan provided for that transit expansion and the options. We are now facing a scenario where not only do we get that expanded transit, but we're gonna have to roll back service that's currently on the street today. Next slide, please. The map on the screen shows bus transit routes that are in operation today. If you were to try and catch a bus, this is the network that you would see. Those routes funded in red are entirely funded by the region. Those routes in blue are funded through a combination of regional and local resources. And those routes in gray are funded entirely through local needs. Next slide, please. This is a similar map, except this is a map for the express routes. So again, these are origin to destination routes and are very effective at getting people into job centers throughout the region. The routes entirely funded by the region are in red, local and regional split are in blue and locally funded are in gray. Next slide. So what does it mean? It means that without an extension of Proposition 400, on January 1st, 2026, our bus transit network is completely decimated. All the lines here in red represent those routes that are at risk. There is a lot of red on this map. Next slide, please. Unfortunately, that map probably underrepresents the issue. As I had mentioned earlier in the pr presentation, the region funds nearly the entirety of the federally mandated ADA paratransit service. That is service that we have to provide regardless of whether or not we have the regional funding source. As a result, because there will be limited local funds, local agencies will have to further cut back those transit routes in order to meet those federal minimum standards. Significant impact on transit without an extension of Prop 400. Next slide, please. In addition, uh, the veto puts at risk all of the high capacity transit that we have identified in the plan. If you think about development patterns in our region, what you're seeing is further densification. You're seeing more multifamily housing. You're seeing people move towards the urban core. High capacity transit is a good solution for those people. Without the extension, these routes are now in jeopardy. Next slide, please. Then finally, impacts to the freeway program. Next slide. The map on the screen shows the current approved Proposition 400 freeway program. There's funding for many of these projects included. Several of them are dependent on future revenue streams. However, without a guaranteed source of continued funding, some of these projects are now at risk. Next slide, please. In particular, several of those projects that are dependent on future revenue streams, there are now open questions about whether or not those projects can move forward. Those projects include interchange improvements at I-10 and Jackrabbit and I-10 and Baseline. For those of you that drive in the area, you know we need these improvements yesterday. These are critically important. State Route 30, we have more than half a billion dollars allocated as part of Proposition 400 for right-of-way acquisition and advanced utility work. That corridor has been set up to be able to move to construction quickly. However, construction is contingent on the extension of Proposition 400. And there are open questions of whether or not we should continue to move forward with that Loop 303 extension south, and whether or not we continue to invest the right-of-way funding in a corridor whose construction future is uncertain. Next slide, please. If you look at the freeway projects we have included in the extension and overlay those on areas seeing significant economic development, the story is even more scary. There are a number of projects that are needed today, needed for economic development that is occurring today, and certainly needed for development in the future. Those include construction of the State Route 30, completion of State Route 24, completion of the 303 improvements up in the North Valley, the list goes on and on. We are the fastest growing county in the United States. Additional investment in the freeway network is needed to keep up with that growth. Next slide, please. The future of freeways here in Maricopa County without the extension is bleak. Funding will have to be focused on meeting federal performance targets. Think more projects focused on state of good repair. 
the region will not be able to keep up with growth. We will not be able to build new freeways. We will have very little ability to widen our existing freeways. We will not have an ability to build new inter interchanges to respond to economic development opportunities. It is a very significant problem. Next slide, please. This chart shows the ADOT long range plan. And I wanna particularly uh, highlight two elements. On the right is the investment for greater Arizona. You see that focus, you see that funding focused on preservation and modernization. Simply put, there's not enough money to build outside of Maricopa County. In Maricopa County, we are able to expand our freeways. We are able to build new freeways. That is only because of the dedicated half cent sales tax. Without it, we will look more like greater Arizona. It will present huge challenges from an economic development perspective. Next slide, please. One of the questions that gets brought up a lot is whether or not we would still be able to move forward with some of these big investments absent the dedicated extension. However, the short answer is no. I wanna highlight it with an example of State Route 30. So just looking at that Loop 303 extension south and only the center segment of State Route 30, it is estimated that that will cost $2.5 billion to construct. That is in today's dollars. Next slide. Now compare that to the other revenues that would be available. That total is equal to our entire 25 year allocation of her funding. We would have to put 25 years worth of her funding on one project to get it built. A lot of, has been brought up about being able to rely on the new Federal Transportation Act to supplant or replace the extension. That's not possible either. Most likely candidate or grant program that a state Route 30 could apply for is the mega program. Let me put it into perspective. So it counts, costs 2.5 billion to build that facility. And the mega program, there's only 1 billion available for the entire nation. Of that 1 billion, only half is available for projects of this size. Moreover, as the region competes for these new federal transportation infrastructure dollars, one of the criteria that the federal government looks at is the amount of local funding that goes into the projects. The higher the local share, the more likely you are to secure those additional federal dollars. Without a dedicated extension of Proposition 400, there is no local dollar to increase that share. Lastly, one of the other solutions that's floated our state appropriations. And while we are grateful for our legislative delegation for securing additional revenues to this region, we cannot rely on legislative appropriations alone to build a $2.5 billion facility. Think about the amount of political capital it costs just to secure 400 million to widen I-10 between the state's two largest metropolitan regions. That took that project being called up by the governor in the state of the state in addition to near unanimous support from the legislature. It took a lot of capital just to get 400 million. We need 2.5 billion. Next slide. We are now at the point where we are beginning to slow the program. As I had mentioned, State Route 30 had been set up to be able to develop or move into construction quickly. Without, with a uncertain future, those development activities have been slowed down. Not only does that have a cost in terms of inflation, it also has a cost in terms of economic development for our region. We will lose businesses that are unable to locate to that corridor. Next slide, please. So what are the key takeaways? Next slide. It is critical that we extend Proposition 400. Uh, further delay will result in increases to project costs. The sooner we can get to the ballot, the sooner we can have a path to the ballot, the better. An inaction or failure to extend Proposition 400 will put significant burden on local agencies. The region will not be able to keep up with the growth that it has been able to keep up with. And a region that is largely built on a 40 year legacy of a sales tax will face a future that they haven't seen in decades. Next slide, please.
What do you think about that dog? <laughs> there are a number of activities uh, that we do have ongoing. Uh, we continue to educate key businesses, key stakeholders, members of the, of the public. This is critically important. And while uh, it might not be quite as in your face as back in 2002, 2003, with still yet uncompleted freeway segments, the cliff is every bit as steep as it was. There is a lot that depends on the extension of Proposition 400, and it is our task to make sure that key stakeholders are aware. We are also partnering on an economic analysis with GPEC to really demonstrate the total value that it has to the region. We've seen preliminary numbers and it is staggering. Uh, that is a presentation that we hope to take forward uh, as soon as next month. But from a competitiveness standpoint, we need to extend Proposition 400. So with that, Mr. Vice Chair, complete my presentation. We'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, John. A very somber report. Uh, do we have any comments or questions from any members of the committee? Uh, yes, uh, Mayor Smith. So being from the city of Maricopa, believe it or not, we have a tiny piece that's in your Prop 400 extension, and we need that desperately, not only for economic development, but also public safety in driving on State Route 347. So we are here and ready to do whatever you need us to do from a city perspective. All of the companies that operate in the city of Maricopa, I know we can engage them if that's necessary. What would you like for us to do? Uh, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the EDC, at this point, we want to get the message out. And so we need your support in helping to get that message out as quickly as possible. Uh, things are very fluid throughout this fall. There's a lot of uncertainty now, uh, you know, including what happens in the November elections. And so right now, we're really focused on the education camp component. Uh, we do know that when we need to activate, we will need a number of people moving quickly. And so it's getting those pieces in place and spreading the message. Very good. In, in terms of spreading the message, at this point, you're not actually requesting then letters to legislation, to the governor's office, not at this point. Okay. No. Thank you very much. I'll spread the word. Uh, thank you, John. I was very, I, I agree, a somber in presentation. Uh, let's say the governor calls a special session. What, how, how do we ensure he doesn't veto it again? You know, that's, that's my concern, is we still have the, the legislature that may approve it, but it still has to go to the governor. Are you working to, with the governor's office to try to tweak it so it's something that he can uh, approve? Or what, what's going on there? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, members of the EDC, you know, I, I think we are committed to exploring all options to get this to the ballot as quickly as possible. Uh, you know, I think the governor outlined uh, what he needed. Um, you know, as part of the veto letter, uh, some of that we see as easy. For example, some of the ballot language, um, we have a lot of confidence in this plan and we know as soon as it hits voters, it's gonna pass. And so that's an easy area. I think our regional council reaffirmed their commitment to the plan, uh, reaffirmed um, their commitment to those projects. As I had mentioned, it's a really delicate balance. So it's not as easy to be able to just pull on one string or another. That being said, you know, I, I think as we look at the future and we know that the need is out there to get this as quickly as possible, I think there's opportunities to uh, uh, make changes within the existing plan itself or within the existing framework. It's just a matter of having those, um, you know, understanding what those needs are. And uh, so we continue to work with key legislators. We continue to educate, we continue to take that feedback, and that'll all be built into the cycle as we look and try and chart our path forward. Any other questions or comments from any members of the committee? Again, John, thank you very much. Uh, I, I think you know that this body uh, fully supports uh, this project and uh, we'll do everything in our power to move it forward. Thanks again. Okay, going on to item uh, five, are there any requests uh, from the membership for an item on the future agenda? Seeing none, uh, are there any additional comments or announcements from any of the members? Vice Chair, I have one. Go ahead. 
Thank you, Vice Chair, members of the EDC. My name is Paul Cardin, and I sit on this uh, committee. I wanted to make everyone aware of a really neat event coming up on September 27th. Uh, you may have received an email from Denise about it. It's called the Coalition on Human Dignity and Religious Freedom. Uh, Dr. Michael Crow is our keynote speaker. We're so lucky to have him join us. And then we'll have three great panels. The first one will be moderated by Justice Clint Bullock of the Arizona Supreme Court. And he'll talk about the current status of religious freedom in the courts. Uh, the second panel will be uh, moderated by Gary Kinneman. Uh, and they'll talk about how do people of faith work with those who are faith neutral and how we can work together on uh, social issues. And the third panel uh, will be moderated by Mayor John Giles, who, who works with MAG uh, on the executive committee. And uh, he'll talk about um, the essence of human dignity and a, uh, an ordinance that passed in Mesa. Uh, he'll have some members of the LGBTQ community on his panel. Um, and they'll talk about some work that they've done together to try to uh, find a middle ground on these important issues. And so it's a wonderful event, a, a truly premier event, September 27th. Uh, the information was given in an email from Denise probably a week or two ago. Uh, I tried to put a link in the chat, but I saw that the chat was disabled. So um, if you have questions, you can, uh, I hope this is okay, Denise, but I, I'll say to respond to Denise. Uh, and of course, if you have my information, I'd be happy to provide that. But we would love to have everyone on this committee attend or those from cities and towns. It's a, It'll be a wonderful event. We invite everyone to come. All right, thank you very much. Uh, any other members have any uh, comments? Or announcements. Seeing none, the next meeting of the MAG Economic Development Committee will be on Tuesday, October 4th at 1130 a.m. Uh, and I'd like to really encourage us to uh, come back to the meeting and to be here in, pres uh, in person. It really adds to, I think, the meeting to, to come back and join us together uh, if you can. I know there's are those circumstances where that's not possible, and that's why we have the uh, telecommunication available. Uh, with that, uh, with no further business, today's meeting is adjourned.